Perhaps you recognize this. This might be something that you've used many times in the past or something you never got into. This is an SLR camera film. More recently, we have DSLR, digital single lens reflex. And this is my current camera with my big zoom lens on it so that I can get those bird shots. Then perhaps you're like, I know granny uses her phone a lot. And so it's this tiny little thing on your phone is a camera. Well, not exactly talking about different types of cameras today, but I just thought it would be an interesting little introduction. And I've got my props here with me. Um, there might be some demonstration. <laughs> so what is the difference between a good photo and a really great photo, like a nice photo and an absolute stunner? It's not a simple recipe and there is a lot of subjectivity. Having said that, there are some solid basic principles. Um, I thought I would you know, explain some of these principles and hopefully make some links and demonstrate how they are applicable to our own walks of faith. So there are many different uses for the word composition, but the relevant definition that I plucked just from Google for photography is the artistic arrangement of the parts of a picture. A picture needs to be arranged such that the most important element, the subject, is appropriately emphasized. Depending on the scene, different elements need to be manipulated in order to reduce or increase their prominence. Other things to consider include the use of light, how it plays upon the subject, what it does and doesn't illuminate. Also, the use of negative space, so space where there's no clear focus, no clear subject is really important to draw your attention to that subject. If you have a look at the two pictures on the right of your screen, I hope you can see them big enough. They are both, you know, the same subject um, and the surroundings are quite similar. For me, however, the lower one, the bottom one is far more striking for three specific reasons. First of all, the blue wren, which is our subject, is not obscured in any way like it is in the top one. And second of all, there is more light directly on the subject, whereas in the top one, it's a lot darker and in shadow, and it makes the detail more difficult to see. And thirdly, there's more unfocused negative space that helps to draw our attention to that blue wren. If I were to comment further on what I could have improved if I'd had the opportunity in that lower photo, I would have said that the branch going through its beak is slightly disruptive. And so those are the sort of things I try and think about when framing a photo. Where possible, because my uh, interest is birds, of course, that tends to be difficult. They often are there and then you take a photo and they're gone and you're lucky if you got the photo. But these are the things I consider to try and get right every time. Try, that's the important word there. I think that this principle can be applied to our Christian lives. The more, most important things in our lives should be the subject, whereas other activities um, that are less important than our faith are better placed in the background. So I don't think personally that we need to remove them, but simply make sure that they are secondary detail and not the subject. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Verses three to five say, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the 12. I think that is our subject and we need to compose our lives around that subject. Secondly, in photography, we have focus. Well, not these things have no particular order of importance. This is just the order I'm discussing them in. So the subject, which in those last photos was our blue wren, the thing we want everyone to focus on, you have to make sure is in focus. These days that involves very little. A phone camera will automatically choose where it wants to focus. And for example, my DSLR is able to accurately 
focus based on the distance. Just when I press my shutter button, it does it all for me. I don't even have to worry about it unless I want to, but most of the time I don't bother. The mechanics of focusing are sort of shown in this diagram here. It's difficult to explain and I don't fully understand it myself really, but the light coming in is angled and focused so that it will fit onto the sensor in a nice accurate image. And that's done by these glass elements, these lens elements. And that's why uh, lenses like this one I bought recently are very expensive because they have very high grade glass uh, in order to accurately focus the light and get a very clear image. Focus is important, of course, and you can see that in the picture below. If, if the focus plane, so the region that's in focus in terms of our distance from us, if that's very narrow, then as you'll see, not all of our subject is actually in focus and you have to choose which part you want to be in focus. I think we can extend this to our Christian lives again. Um, it may feel like it's just a slight nuance of the composition idea, but I argue that it's also different. Importantly, as Christians, I believe that we should focus for long distance, i.e. God's kingdom. This doesn't make everything else of no importance, but just not our main focus. As Matthew 6 says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Shutter speed. Shutter speed is the length of time the sensor is exposed to light for any one photo. This is, it's a little bit hard to explain, but it's controlled by the distance between, if you can see up here, I think it's playing, I hope, um, the distance between the blades of the shutter as it comes down allows that sensor behind it or the film in film cameras to be exposed to light and to that picture for a certain amount of time. The effect of shutter speed is to make a moving subject more stationary or less stationary. For example, a still landscape scene does not need to have a fast shutter speed. In fact, often it involves having a long shutter speed to blur any movement. As you can see in this middle picture here, I had the shutter open, fully open, exposing the sensor for 10 whole seconds. This means that the sensor captured the light for that whole length of time and it makes the water appear blurred, but everything else is quite clear and sharp because it wasn't moving, or at least not much. On the other end of the spectrum, the yellow-tailed black cockatoo in flight that you can see on the right, I used an exposure time of 1, 1,250th of a second, which is very fast. And so that allows me to capture that single instant with no blurring. The faster the shutter speed, the less light will actually land on the sensor. And that brings other technical difficulties, which you must compensate for. Shutter speed is important in our lives, I think, because we can often be running with a lot of tension and little time to stop and pray or consider God's word. This means that less of God's light is getting to our sensor. And while we sometimes need to be in the instant, in that moment, it's important to remember to adjust based on the circumstances and take time to be holy. Speak oft with the Lord. Find rest in him always and feed on his word. As you may know, those hymn lyrics, I quite like them. Moving on now to aperture. The aperture is, as you can see from that diagram above, I hope, the width of the hole that the light is finally focused through. I can also demonstrate that hopefully a little better. I'm getting my um, lens off the SLR camera I have here. And you can see, uh, I hope, <laughs> if I hold it nice and close, 
that I'm changing the aperture size. And you can see that that's where the light will pass through. The effect of aperture is to also to determine how much light is able to get through and hit the sensor. But it also impacts what we call depth of field. Depth of field is the distance where objects will appear in focus. So a large aperture, which is a lower number, will result in a very narrow depth of field. So if you have a scene that goes, say you have different subjects spaced apart over say 10 meters, you will only be able to focus on a very narrow region at any one point. If you have a smaller aperture, so a larger number, it allows you to focus on more things. As an example, here's a scene from our garden, mum's beautiful garden out the front. And this has a fairly, a fairly open aperture, but that makes what is in focus a very narrow area, as you can see. Uh, so I put the number, this is called F4, that's the number system for aperture, how we describe it. Um, you can see just that that flower and the branch it's on is in focus and everything else is very blurred. When I take the same photo, but I make that, make that hole smaller, it allows more things to be in focus. So you can see that the background is still slightly blurred, but it's clearer. And then if I do that even further, it makes almost everything quite clear, but it also makes everything just a little bit less clear than if I focus on one thing more specifically. So the aperture is used differently for different subjects. Landscape scenes, such as that river that I showed before, are more suited to retaining all the detail, so a smaller aperture, whereas portraiture suits a nice blurred background. If we refer back to the start when I mentioned composition, I suggest that we should allow the worldly things in our live, lives to be in the blurred background. And this is the mechanism, photographically, how we might blur the background like that. Returning to Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 21, says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The ISO is the sensitivity to light of the sensor. So previously, this referred to the size of the grains in film containing a photosensitive chemical. Digital photography has provided the advantage of being able to change the sensitivity, so the ISO, from picture to picture whereas it used to be one roll of film would be the same sensitivity. The advantage that this gives us is that a higher ISO, more sensitive to light, means that we can use faster shutter speeds and make a moving subject appear more stationary with less light. And sometimes that's important, like night photography, when you still want to have a subject nice and clear, even if they're moving. There is a limit to it, of course. <laughs> so the disadvantage, though, is that the higher ISO value gives a grainier photo, and it can also affect the colour accuracy. Um, to put it simply, the photo quality will decrease as you increase the sensitivity. And you can see that on the right with that photo I took of Mitzi, our cat. The top photo is ISO 100 which is a low sensitivity and what we would normally try to use to get the best detail and sharpness. And the bottom one using a very high ISO. And you can see that the colors are a bit more distorted. And if you were able to see it clearly, um, there are more visible grains. It's, it's a bit hard to explain, but it does make a big difference. My suggested link to our faith here is emotional sensitivity. Empathy and understanding are, I believe, fundamental to Christian life. I think we should not be sensitive about what people think of us, but be very sensitive about other people's feelings, 
so that we don't estrange them by our words or actions. A simple yet surprisingly difficult think before you speak method is useful. And I strive to practice that and I need to do it a lot because it's difficult. <laughs> Finally, we have a photograph or photography in general. So I hope I've adequately, adequately explained some of the mechanisms of taking a world-class photo. If I ever take one, I'll let you know how it goes. <laughs> Unfortunately, for anyone who thought that taking a photo was a simple thing, I didn't cover aspects such as white balance, exposure compensation, picture profiles, autofocus methods and layouts, shutter release methods, and there are many other things that are buried deeper in camera settings. I hope this helps you appreciate the computation that happens every time you click the shutter or tap it if it's your phone, every time you take a photo, all of this is done automatically. I also hope that I made some relevant links with our lives, specifically our lives as Christians. I'll leave you with a saying that I quite like. It's a little bit less relevant in this digital age, but I think it's, it's nice. It's a very nice one. So life is like photography. We develop from the negatives. Amen. <laughs>